Over the next two videos, we'll be taking a look at the data structure hash tables. You'll become familiar with the concept of a hash table and its uses, be able to apply simple hashing algorithms, and know what is meant by collision and how collisions are handled by using a concept known as rehashing. Before we dive into looking at hash tables, we're first going to look at the advantages and limitations of a couple of other data structures. These were arrays and linked lists. Now, arrays you'll already be familiar with, and as you know, we use them to store a single data type continuously in memory. This is because every element of an array is associated with its own index. This is a very powerful feature of an array, and it means we have quick and easy random access to all the elements of an array with a single command. Here you can see that we directly access a single element of the array, in this case element 4, with just a single line of code. This is important. You've already seen that binary trees store their information in array structures and require random access directly into any element of an array. A limitation though of the array data structure is that it's fixed in size. This is because the array stores items continuously in memory. So when you declare it, you have to fix its size. You're in effect telling the operating system when you declare the array to set aside as much memory for use as you think you're going to need. There is no way to guarantee that more memory adjacent to your array will be available for use later on. This is why arrays can't easily grow and they're known as static data structures. Now, this next data structure is not technically in the specification for AQA A-Level. It's called a linked list, but it's a very useful data structure to know about, especially when trying to understand hash tables a bit later. A linked list is a dynamic data structure, and as such, it can grow while a program is being used. This is because each item or element in a linked list is not stored continuously in memory. Each element in a linked list contains the data we want, plus a pointer, effectively a memory address, to the location of the next item in the linked list in memory. Of course, there's a price for this. We now have a dynamic data structure, but we can't now access its elements randomly. If we want to find an item in a linked list, we have to start at the beginning, and we have to follow the linked list checking each element as we go until we find the item we want. This could make for a very inefficient search, especially if the list is large and the item we're looking for is towards the end. So just to recap quickly, arrays allow random access to any element but are static, whereas list links are dynamic but can be slow to search. Hash tables combine the best features of both data types. And they're most commonly used when speed of lookup or deletion or insertion of items is a priority. So, what exactly is a hash table? In effect, it is simply an array which we call a hash table, which is coupled together with a hash function. The hash function is a piece of code which takes in some kind of data, which we call a key, and then chucks out a value which we call a hash value. The hash value maps our initial key to a fixed index in our hash table. In the first instance you use the hash function to work out where in the hash table to store the data for a given key. The hash function will always chuck out the same value for any given key, so later you can use it to determine where in the hash table a given item will be found based on its key. Here we're using uh, an incredibly simple hash function for demonstration purposes. So um, the address is going to equal value and then mod 50. In other words, it's going to take in a numerical value or a key, it's going to perform mod 50 on it, and then it's going to spit out our key, or our value. In this example, 
uh, we have simply converted our string data values into their corresponding ASCII character codes. And we've coded those values, or hard-coded those values, here for simplicity. Of course, this would actually happen programmatically. So, the numbers of our keys here are passed, one at a time, into our hash function. Dave, when thrown in, generates the hash value 1. Craig generates the hash value 3. Sam 9, Carol 8, and finally Mark 7. This allows us to map these initial keys to these locations in our hash table. Should we ever wish to retrieve Dave from the hash table, we simply feed the key Dave into the hash function and it will return the position of where to find Dave, position 1. So far, so good. So, let's try adding another item to our hash table. Uh, this time, Amy. The key Amy gets fed into our hash function and it spits out the value 1 again. So what happens now? Well, if we go to index 1 in our hash table, we find that Dave is already here. This is known as a collision. One solution is to check the next available space, index 2. We discover it's empty, so we could store Amy here instead. Simple enough. OK, so let's now try adding Jesse. Well, once again, Jesse generates a hash value of 1. And of course, Dave is already in this position. If we check the next one, Amy's there, Craig's then full, we could now put Jess in location 4. Now, in fact, any name which ends in letter E will generate a hash value of 1. And this, of course, is because we're using an incredibly simplistic and inefficient hash function. A good hash function should be designed so it tries to avoid creating duplicate hash values. However, they are unavoidable, and here we have a problem. When a collision occurs, we're using the next available space in the hash table. However, every time we do this, we increase the likelihood of further collisions. And this problem is known as clustering. Now, if you've been paying attention to the start of the video, you probably already know a solution. And one of those is to use linked lists. So if we go back to our Amy example, we feed the key into the hash function and the hash value 1 is generated. We discover Dave is already in index 1. So now we go to our overflow for index 1 and we store Amy here. Jess would end up in the linked list directly after Amy and so on. We've gained all the benefits of fast random access to an array type data structure while avoiding clustering. If the hash function is good, we're not going to use this overflow very much, so it's going to be short. We've massively sped up finding data. We simply feed a key into the hash function, go to the hash table in the location given, and if the item we want is not there, we search the overflow sequentially. OK, that's a pretty comprehensive overview of hash tables. In the next video, we're going to look at some basic pseudocode for adding, searching and removing data from a hash table.